Our Island Story, Chapter Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story, by H. E. Marshall, Chapter Four. How Caligula conquered Britain, and how Caractacus refused to be conquered. After the second coming of Caesar, years passed during which the Romans left the Britons in peace, but they had by no means forgotten about the little green island in the blue sea. Julius Caesar had been dead many years when a Roman emperor called Caligula. Said he would go to Britain and thoroughly conquer the island. He did not mean to land and fight in one small part of it as Julius Caesar had done. He meant to march over the island, north, south, east, and west, and bring it all under the power of Rome. That is what he said he was going to do. What he really did was something quite different. He gathered a great army and marched from Italy right through France till he reached the coast. There news came to him that Gildarius, the king of Britain, had heard of his coming, and had also gathered his soldiers together. Caligula must have been afraid when he heard that the brave Britons were ready to fight him, for this is how he conquered Britain. He drew his soldiers up in battle array upon the shore. Then he himself went into his galley and told his sailors to row him out to sea. After they had rowed him a short way, he told them to return. When he had landed again, he climbed into a high seat like a pulpit, which he had built on the sands. Then he sounded a trumpet and ordered his soldiers to advance as if to battle. But there was no enemy there. In front of the soldiers, there was nothing but the blue sea and the sandy shore covered with shells. They could not fight against the waves and the sand. And the brave Britons whom they had come to fight were far away on the other side of the water and quite out of reach. So the soldiers stood and wondered what to do. Then Caligula ordered them to kneel down upon the sand and gather as many shells as they could. The first thing a Roman was taught was to obey, so now the soldiers did as their general commanded and gathered the cockle shells which lay around in hundreds. It must have been a curious sight to see all these strong soldiers, armed with sword, shield, and helmet, picking up shells upon the seashore. When they had gathered a great quantity, Caligula made a speech. He thanked the soldiers as if they had done him some great service. He told them that now he had conquered the ocean and the islands in it, and that these shells were the spoils of war. He praised the soldiers for their bravery. And said that the shells should be placed in the temples of Rome in remembrance of it. Then he rewarded them richly, and they marched home again. That was how Caligula conquered Britain. After the death of Caligula, another Roman called Claudius tried to conquer Britain. He sent generals and came himself, but he could not thoroughly subdue the Britons. A few chiefs, indeed, owned themselves beaten, but others would not. They would rather die than be slaves of Rome, they said. Among those who would not yield was a brave man called Caractacus. A great many of the Britons joined him and fought under his orders. Caractacus and his men fought well and bravely, but in the end the Romans defeated them. After many battles, Caractacus chose for his camp a place on the top of a hill on the borders of Shropshire, Cheshire, and Lancashire. There he made a very strong fortress, surrounded by three walls and a deep ditch. These walls were so well built that after all these long years, they can still be seen quite plainly today. When the Roman soldiers came to the foot of the hill, Caractacus prepared for battle. He called his soldiers together and made a speech to them. "Show yourselves to be men," he said. "Today is either the beginning of liberty or of eternal bondage." Remember how your forefathers fought against Julius Caesar, and fight now for your homes as they did for theirs. Then all the Britons called out, "We will die for our country." 
The noise of their shouts was carried by the wind to the camp of the Romans. It sounded to them as if the Britons were rejoicing. The Romans feared Caractacus. They knew how brave he and his men were. They knew that it would be very difficult to take his strong fortress. Yet they felt quite sure of taking it in the end, and they wondered what cause the Britons had for rejoicing. And it happened as the Romans expected. After fierce fighting and great slaughter on both sides, the camp was taken. Caractacus, his wife and daughter, and all his brothers were made prisoner, and led in chains to Rome, and there was great sorrow in Britain. Whenever a Roman emperor returned from battle and victory, he used to have what was called a triumph. Every one in Rome had a holiday. The streets were gay with flowers and green wreaths. The conqueror, dressed in beautiful robes and wearing a crown of bay leaves, rode through the streets. He was followed by his soldiers, servants, and friends. Then came a long train of the captives he had made during the war, with the armor, weapons, jewels, and other riches he had taken from the conquered people. After the war with Britain was over, Claudius had a triumph. The fame of Caractacus had already reached Rome, and when it became known that he had been taken prisoner and would walk in the triumph, there was great excitement. The people crowded into the streets, eager to see this brave warrior. And, although in chains, he looked so proud and noble, that many even of the Romans were sorry for him. When he was brought before the emperor and empress, Claudius and Agrippina, he did not behave like a slave or a captive, but like the free-born king and Briton he was. "'I am as nobly born as you,' he said proudly to Claudius. "'I had men and horses, lands and great riches. Was it wonderful that I wished to keep them? You fight to gain possession of the whole world and make all men your slaves, but I fought for my own land and for freedom. Kill me now and people will think little of you.' but if you grant me my life, all men will know that you are not only powerful, but merciful. Instead of being angry, Claudius was pleased with the proud words of Caractacus. He was so pleased that he set him at liberty with his wife and all his family. But whether Caractacus ever returned to his dear country, or whether he died in that far-off land, we do not know. We do not hear anything more about him. End of chapter 4 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On May 11, 2006 In Oceanside, California